Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 20th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the Somerville Media Center update with the City Council. I am joined today by City Councilor from Ward 2, JT Scott. JT doing triple duty these days. Elected official, businessman, and dad school teacher. How you doing? Oh, I'm hanging in there, Mr. Lynch, as best as we all can. I think we're all uh, figuring out a way to make it through this new normal. Well, we are. We are. Humans are, uh, there is a good part of the population that are disinclined to change, and there are those who are very adaptable. And in these times, we have to learn uh, a couple of things. I've, I've got my new guiding two words that I use when I wake up in the morning, patience, and kindness and, and I wish I had practiced that for a good 50 years before but I'm learning very quickly um, JT I want to do a quick update um, Matt McLaughlin is not going to be joining us today you have 20 minutes with me I know you're overjoyed uh, as I am with you um, COVID the city of Somerville is holding steady uh, but we are seeing the increases not only in the number of positive cases, uh, but in the rate of increase, which caused um, the city of Somerville to slide into what is now being referred to as the red zone, um, meaning that we are dangerously close to exceeding what is acceptable. I did notice last night while I was on the phone with some folks who live in Everett, they are now starting to get alerts on their cell phones uh, from the city of Everett. There were multiple municipalities that were getting those last night, Revere, Chelsea, Everett, Winthrop, um, and a few others. JT, do we have anything in the city that you're aware of that residents should be aware of that we may start getting those alerts if our rates go higher? Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I got a couple of those alerts too uh, for Chelsea, Everett, Revere, and you know, I was a little confused by them. Uh, first, as to why they're coming out now, uh, this is not a new situation. This has been ravaging our communities for seven months and completely fundamentally changing our way of life. So I'm, I'm not sure who's not aware of this. Um, so those were put out by the state. Um, you know, uh, and, and secondly, what's, what's the rationale for the communities involved? Uh, I'll say I'm not a giant fan of the, the simplistic color map, but it certainly does give uh, a graphic uh, alarm to say, well, your city's now in the red. Uh, we have been, I think, taking uh, extraordinary precautions here in Somerville, and it's frustrating. Um, but even with those extraordinary precautions, I think it's important to understand that this this disease uh, and its impacts are not equitably or equally distributed. The, the impacts of this are falling catastrophically on our non-English speaking populations as we see from the request data that came in from the Somerville's CARES Fund and very little reported public data such as last time I checked, I think somewhere over 80% of our cases here in Somerville are from people of color. And that's not because this disease is somehow selective based on race, it's because of the socioeconomic pressures um, that are placed on these communities. And I think it's absolutely essential that we recognize that as just another one of the insidious, perfidious impacts of um, structural racism. There's no other term for it. And so our, our response to it has to be grounded in, in equity. It has to be uh, rooted in an awareness of that and attempting to redress those, uh, those inequities. And you know, I think the discussion about how to, how to redress those in a larger sense in a constructive fashion is an, an important one. But right now, this is causing displacement and death amongst uh, populations that have already suffered more over the course of human history. So, or at yeah. least in our country. JT, I do want to talk about the displacement issue and the effect that it is having on the less affluent and those of us, uh, I'm going to include you in it, you know, you, those of us who are privileged enough um, to be white in 2020 America 
and to have financial wherewithal to weather the storm as best we can. Yeah, it's disrupting to our lives, but you know, every morning I wake up and I think about how fortunate I am to have a roof over my head, to have food on my table, and to have friends and family that are around me. And I can't help but think how disruptive and how absolutely wrenching this is for people who have instability in their life. I wanna go back to one thing that you mentioned about the color coding. Um, I would I highly recommend that people familiarize themselves with the city um, public health dashboard. That gives you the graphics and it gives you information about not only the rate of infection, whether we are going down or we're going up. It gives you information about the mortality, which is a gobsmack in the head when you think about it, that we've lost 42 or 43 people in this community. It also tells you where that infection is higher. And one of the things that jumps out at me a lot is when you go to the dashboard, you can see the graphic of the zip code where it's mostly affecting Somerville. And you're absolutely spot on. It, it is almost concentrated in the 02145 zip code, which incorporates a large part of our less affluent parts of the city. Um, so it's a, it demonstrates how unfair this whole thing is. So I just wanted to do the quick COVID update with you. I know the council is working, constantly working on other initiatives along with our public health director in the mayor's office. Um, you talked a, li a little bit about the displacement factor. You want to address um, in an update what's happened with the eviction moratorium statewide and then what we are still doing here in Somerville. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate you calling out the 4-5. I mean, 02145 is, has been from the very first time we got uh, zip code level data, just a glaring, um, just a glaring problem. And not just in the fact that we are seeing more cases there and a higher percentage of positive cases there, but also that's the area where we have the lowest testing coverage. And all of this goes to, you know, who has the time to go get tested? Who has access to those resources? Who is aware that the testing program is available? Where does the outreach actually reach in this city? Um, and also the, the, the privilege, as you point out, of having a roof over your head and having some moderate uh, assurance that it'll still be there next month um, and, and not have to go put yourself and your family at greater risk. Uh, in order to ensure that, that you have a better chance of having that roof over your head. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the housing moratorium is, a, is a, just a nightmare story that we're in right now. Governor Baker recently ended it. Uh, so this week, cases, tens of thousands of eviction cases are making their way into and through our court system. And, you know, while this is a nightmare that is going to accelerate thanks to this, we have seen, uh, landlords attempting to evict tenants even throughout the midst of this. And those evictions are not just illegal evictions where they send somebody over to change the locks on your house, but also the displacement that happens because your landlord raises your rent by 40% in the middle of a global pandemic, or just tells you, hey, look, I'm not renewing your lease. You got to get out. Um, that's, it simply flies in the face of everything we know about public health and safety uh, at this time. And I think, you know, outside of my larger views on housing as a human right, even if you don't share those views, uh, right now it's inhumane to consider displacing people in the middle of a pandemic and frankly puts all of us at greater risks and slows down uh, the pace at which we can reopen our schools or get this pandemic under control and get it back to normal. So I think what Governor Baker has done here by eliminating the Massachusetts eviction moratorium is just unleashed an even greater wave of legal cruelty uh, and pandemic, just pandemonium <laughs> that is going to spread through these communities. It's, um, and again, we know, we know for a fact based on eviction data who this is gonna land hardest on. Um, so I, I am distraught. Uh, I am, however, grateful for the work of the Office of Housing Stability here in, in Somerville uh, that is actually putting on even more temporary staff, uh, all of whom are at least bilingual uh, to ensure that we have resources uh, and have caseworkers that can 
and work with these families to try to connect them to what limited state assistance there is uh, and also local resources. I'm also incredibly grateful for the work of the Somerville, Medford uh, Somerville Mutual Aid. Uh, for those who are interested, that's mutualaidmamas.com. And uh, so that, that mutual aid network that's grown since the very earliest days of the pandemic has been providing direct rental assistance to people to keep them in their houses. And right now, the housing security working group there is uh, collaborating with groups like Democratic Socialists of America and City Life Theater Urbana. Um, there was recently, just last night actually, a teach-in workshop that was hosted online about how to prevent evictions in your neighborhood. And that's going to be important. As we see this cruelty deployed, um, it is not enough that we have a policy here in Somerville that says you can't physically remove somebody from your home, which is true. We do have a policy which says the constables cannot come and remove you, but that information isn't enough. First of all, I'm not sure it'll actually get followed. And secondly, we'd be counting on calling the police to enforce a rule which is in complete opposition to the role police normally play during the eviction process. So what's gonna be important is that neighbors see these things happening, know that their neighbors are at risk of displacement and work directly to keep them in their houses. Uh, understanding how to do that in a constructive and nonviolent fashion is really important. So I'm glad that these networks are out there educating people. And uh, it's unfortunate that we are put in this situation by Governor Baker, um, but I am heartened to see the city and my neighbors um, lead to respond. JT, any sense of other municipalities, what they're doing? Do they have similar local restrictions on eviction? Uh, city of Boston, City of Cambridge, Brookline, Newton, are they taking the same type of action that Somerville is taking? You know, that's a great question, Joe. To be honest with you, I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor. I break out in hives when I go up on Spring Hill. I don't want to know what happens if I go into Cambridge. But, uh, you know, it's so I, I can't really speak to it. Honestly, I've got uh, 11,000 people right here in my little patch and, and 80,000 people in the city of Somerville. And the demand and need just in that alone is truly heartrending and overwhelming. And I mean that literally, it has overwhelmed our capacity to respond to it. So, um, I, boy, I sure hope there's folks fighting in those cities, but right now I'm just fighting here in Somerville. Well, I tell you, I mean, the media center has become more and more important to dissemination of information. And I've got a call in to Alan Schachter. Um, I know the city has been doing forums uh, with the mayor about the eviction notification, what the tenants' rights are, who they should call. But I think, um, you know, to give 28 minutes exclusively to Ellen and her work at the um, Housing Stability Office, I, I think that is vitally important going forward. You know, with the courts, I just saw something yesterday, it, either yesterday or today, about the courts are now starting to reopen to handle the influx of eviction uh, eviction actions, whether they're being taken by the landlords to try to evict, or they're being taken by the tenants to try to protect themselves from illegal eviction. It is going to be in the Ver Somerville vernacular, a, um, um, a poop storm. So, I really think that, you know, whatever we can do to assist the city council, the mayor, Ellen Schechter, anybody, you know, any of the not-for-profit organizations like Mamas, you know, we're going to do because I cannot think of anything in your word, and I'll echo it, in you, anything more cruel than to put somebody out of their home during a pandemic at the beginning of winter. That just seems like a Dickensian um, novel in the making. So um, let's move, JT, if we can. Anything else on the docket from City Council last time you folks met in Council and maybe coming up? I think you have a board meeting, uh, Council meeting this Thursday. Is that correct? We do have a City Council meeting this Thursday. And honestly, the work of the City Council isn't just an every other week thing. Um, you know, we have committee meetings literally Monday through Thursday every week. Uh, and a lot of the important work happens in those committees, but it's nice to have these punctuations of the regular city council meeting where uh, official votes are taken on things that become law, for example. I mean, the work on zoning doesn't stop just because the zoning overhaul that happened last year. 
there is a lot of really important work happening in uh, Council Human Campins Land Use Committee around an affordable housing overlay, uh, which just recognizes that our 20% inclusionary zoning isn't enough uh, and attempts to answer the question of what more we can do with zoning to get out of the way and establish a favorable environment for 100% affordable housing projects to happen here in the city. Uh, I happen to think that's a half measure. I think we should be doing, building public housing. And I am a strong supporter of the Community Land Trust as an avenue for getting to community-owned, permanently affordable housing. Um, but I think this is an important step. I, I think there's no way to get to the final answer or, or um, the, the end goal in a single leap. So a step like this is an important one, and I think one that uh, will get adopted by other cities uh, in the Commonwealth as they see the success of it. So um, that's important work that continues in Land Use Committee. There is um, recently, and perhaps in surprising news, uh, the City Council just in our last meeting adopted uh, a new ordinance, a new law, uh, preventing the use of prison labor here in Somerville, which may seem to be kind of, um, gilding the lily until you realize that every year for the last decade, including last year, uh, the city of Somerville, instead of hiring and paying local residents to do work in the city, was using slave labor, was using prisoners from the Middlesex Sheriff's Office uh, to paint our city buildings and maintain city properties. Um, and these are people who are incarcerated, who continue to be incarcerated. And the only compensation they receive is a few minutes in the sunshine uh, a sandwich for lunch and uh, pay from the Middlesex Sheriff of less than $2 an hour. So, so all the while JT is still advertising the fact in their bright orange jumpsuits that they are prisoners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just horrifically cruel. It is uh, just another example of what's very, very wrong with uh, a few elements in our system. And while I can't make the Middlesex Sheriff stop that, I can, it's, you know, it's enshrined in state law. I can't uh, abolish the way we maintain so many of our neighbors in incarceration. Right now, I can certainly say that the city of Somerville won't participate. Um, and I was glad to bring this forward uh, once I discovered that this was happening and uh, grateful that my colleagues supported it. So, you know, again, incremental steps. Um, there's also incremental steps uh, coming up at this next meeting of the city council. I'm actually really happy to bring forward. Hey, JT, oh. let me make one comment on the on the prison labor thing. You know, I'm slightly older than you are, and I do remember um, prisoners either um, you know doing kind of DPW jobs, uh, picking up trash, cleaning up parks. And then at the beginning of this uh, beginning of this decade, um, well, mid decade, we were using them to paint city owned buildings, um, to do other types of, of labor intensive things. All the while, I, you know, I, I use the word cruel too. It's kind of cruel putting people out there in yellow jumpsuits. Um, and at one point they were restrained. So let's not forget about, you know, people with maybe an ankle bracelet or something clearly indicating um, who they were, what they were, and in my words, being held up to public ridicule. You know, it, it kind of harkens back to the day prior to me, prisoners were used to make license plates for the state. And we kind of thought of that as a good use of prison labor. Um, I don't know, it's just my thoughts, you know? Well, and it's, you know, I'd say you're right, and this has been happening for a long time, but that, that concept of our incarcerated neighbors, uh, the, the incarcerated population of Massachusetts as some kind of resource to be tapped for greater productivity is a sickness. It's a sickness that leads to all kinds of, I mean, if you accept that as your starting premise, then absolutely, utilize that resource. And absolutely, it's such a valuable, lucrative resource, you need more of it, right? We need more people in prison so we can have cheaper labor for all these public works projects. That's a sickness. And it not only needs to be stopped, it needs to be called out and completely obliterated. Um, so I, is... As opposed to the real reason for any incarceration, which is rehabilitation. Get them well, in. I, I mean, I'm not gonna you know, debate the rule of law, but some... Some laws are patently unfair. Other people should be 
incarcerated. But the main objective is not to keep them incarcerated and use them as, in your words, slaves. I mean, the main objective is you've done something that is against the law. We're going to try to rehabilitate you so we can get you out of here and you don't do it again. I mean, to me, it's a simple, it, it, it is more simple in my mind than the actual issue is. It's a very complicated issue. But that, I, I agree with you. You don't be using people for slave labor, period. I don't, I don't care who they are. Right. It, it's tough to find an argument in favor of it, Joe. But I think your point there about, you know, finding out, you know, how to rehabilitate, how to, how to prevent a recurrence of this. I mean, ultimately, the best way to prevent violence, the best way to prevent uh, crime that comes out of substance addiction uh, or, or mental health issues or even just the desperation that comes from poverty and housing instability is to improve those conditions. And so that's one of the things that's actually uh, that I'm bringing before the city council this week is a program that is developed. It's, um, it's about looking at, it's called intercept mapping. Uh, and it's a way to look at how people end up in these situations and where they start interacting with the criminal justice system, which again, once they're involved with it, it's a complete nightmare. So a lot of the discussion over the last year here in Somerville is about how to uh, decrease the role and the need for the police department, uh, especially in these situations where sending somebody with a gun doesn't necessarily help improve the situation. And certainly incarcerating someone never improves their situation and the situation of their families. So we, you know, this is a, this is a really interesting opportunity. It's something that's based out of uh, work that's been happening in the Department of Health and Human Services here in Somerville and in Health and Human Services departments all over the country. But it's an opportunity for us to, to really engage with that thorny question of what does a compassionate system look like that actually tries to improve these material conditions and intercept uh, what would otherwise be a call to the police department with instead a response from a trauma response network or uh, somebody who is informed, who can then work with both the people in those situations and with community organizations that are engaged in solving those problems locally, rather than putting somebody uh, into a position where they're just gonna be slave labor for the next town over. JT, so, JT, it took this country 350 years to get into the mindset that we have now about crime and punishment. And I don't think we're gonna solve it in, in 28 minutes that you and I have, but we're certainly, it is a conversation that needs to be ongoing every time we think about crime and punishment. Um, I would like to say it's really mm, maybe a crime and rehabilitation rather than crime and punishment, the way that we've morphed this system. I wanna jump quickly because I am gonna get short on time. You were talking about anything that's coming up on this Thursday night for the city council's agenda? Uh, well, that's certainly on there. Um, there are also a few uh, big items. Uh, I'll admit to, to being closest to the things in the finance committee just because I'm the chair of that committee. Uh, but there are some large items, um, some large items that are before us, such as uh, an expansion of the funding for the West Branch Library Project, which is currently behind schedule, as just about everything is, um, but is also over budget by over a million and a half dollars. Um, and so additional funding and time is being requested on that project, which I think everybody supports and wants to see happen. Um, an additional uh, funding request is being made for Conway Park, which has been declared a super fun site. Um, the question of whether or not to put artificial turf or grass on there is one that is currently filling my inbox. Um, but the request right now is for just over $6 million for that uh, rehabilitation and of a, uh, JT, I'm always interested in Conway Park because I remember the first iteration of trying to rehab that site. What was the price tag the first time? Do you recall? You know, it's a great question and I have dug for a lot of uh, information data on that, most of which isn't really available. And it's unfortunate because like you said, this park was redone uh, and not, <laughs> not outside of living memory. So the discovery of horrifically toxic levels of contamination in this soil, not very far from the surface, uh, including uh, 
you know, PCB toxins in the playground area in the front, which was constructed only very recently, says to me that something got missed in a really, really significant way. And so, um, you know, I can say I can say it because it's it's part of our show. Um, it, it, it for me, it smells of criminal negligence. That's what it smells like to me. You spend all this money, you have a public process, and then wham, bam, um, the park gets redone. And then in less than a decade later, you find out, whoops, there was something wrong here. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to go that far, Joe, just because I, I try to be careful. Of My that. show, I can say. Um, but I will say it, it is absolutely concerning. And, um, you know, while finding out that is going to be part of a reconciliation process that I think is going to take some time and some dedication to stay with it, to get those answers about what actually happened during uh, the various phases of uh, construction in Conway Park over the decades, I would say right now the, the crisis that we're facing is the decision that will last for the next hundred years which is whether or not we rehabilitate that field to the lowest possible legal standard, uh, which will only allow for artificial turf to be on that surface until we decide to dig deeper, or if we're going to take a little bit of extra time and a little bit of extra money right now to ensure that we have a space that's gonna be flexible and can be deployed for grass, for trees, for other uh, environmentally sensitive purposes in the future. So. That's going to be the big fight that happens tonight in the Finance Committee and will probably happen again on Thursday night. But uh, as always, no shortage of excitement at the City Council. Um, I just hopefully, uh, I, I just send my warmest wishes to all my neighbors out there who are just trying to make it work with virtual kindergarten, virtual school, working from home, and uh, keeping their families with a roof over their heads. And that's the most important thing right now. JT, best wishes on all your work on the finance, on housing, on social justice. Um, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Joe. Have a great one. We'll see you next time. For the Somerville Media Center Live, I'm Joe Lynch. My guest has been City Councilor Ward 2, J.T. Scott. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.